Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Dwayne Monroe. Uh, he's uh, an author and a tech industry insider, and he manages the website Computational Impacts at MonroeLab.net. Um, what we want to do today is, first of all, this is going to be my first cyber part of the uh, Cyber Dandy project. And uh, what we want to do with that is burst your bubble about technology, uh, especially when it comes to Dwayne's focus area, which is AI. So to get into that, uh, I have come to very similar conclusions as Dwayne over the years, uh, working in the industry and just studying computers and the history of technology and really seeing how much hype there has been uh, around technology and um, really making a mythology out of uh, how it really works. And um, both of us focus on the material circumstances that underlie any kind of data. Um, so that's the approach we're going to take. And um then we're going to get into a whole bunch of other stuff so before we kick that off Dwayne, did you have any news or updates for anyone who might not have seen you in a while uh only that uh progress on my book um attack mannequins which is about the ai industry but not as a technical pursuit but as a propaganda campaign um progress is proceeding nicely so i i anticipate having that complete in about six months and um, um, for any other updates, um, you can you can follow me at my um, my Twitter handle, which is at Cloud Keystador, um, which I came up with a little while ago um, when I realized that um, the Conquistador is and cloud technology had things in common, not good things, and um, and also as Jared said at uh, RunnerLab.net. Awesome. All right. So, uh, what most people don't realize about computers is that all of the mathematics and the ideas for how they work are quite old and uh they go back to what i think is a form of lambda calculus is that correct i i would say so as well and and one of the things that honest um practitioners or researchers in machine learning as it's called one of the most uh, successful areas of so-called AI is linear regression, which is a, a statistical method that has existed for quite some time. So yeah, as you say, um, the mathematics um, uh, uh, is, is quite old in many, in many cases. And even, even if it's not quite old, it's decades old. Um, mm -hmm. And what has enabled some of the things that we're seeing now, such as DALI or GPT-3, um, is an increase in hardware capability and the fact that organizations such as Google um, are pouring billions into um, scaling the effects that they can achieve using these mathematical techniques um, uh, enacted via, via um, hyperscale computing. Right, exactly. So what I like to say is when it comes to computing, the bottom line is hardware. Yeah. And um, that's the piece that gets hidden uh, as as you've gone over uh, on other things I've seen. And um, I wanted to just like go through some of the the history of just computers in general or what or computation in general and talk about um, how we got to where we are. So uh, so basically, I think that, computation really comes down to a very simple idea, which is something that turns on and turns off uh, or anything that could be in one state or another. And so we see that with Morse code or the way that the actual film on a CD or DVD is etched. Or looms that were used to, you know, to make uh, clothing um, um, in the, my God, I think as long ago as the 17th century, or certainly the 18th century. Yeah, there, there have been many examples of the use of um, 
um, algorith algorithmic methods, which is just you know a method of um, um, creating an instruction set, actually, um, whatever that might be, whether it's analog or digital, um, on and off, of course, refers to digital, but analog um, computation, which predates um, uh, even an electronic form, predates digital, um, use the position of, uh, for example, sine waves um, and position of uh, frequencies in order to determine states. Yeah, so uh, you're right. Computation long predates um, what we're what we're seeing today, um, because it's a method of um, of organizing information, and that information could be what hunter gatherers are doing, you know, mm -hmm. within their environment. You know, they have forms of computation, um, that is to say, ways of of recording the movements of uh, of the of the stars, with methods of um, understanding exactly what the cycles of nature were. Um, and so they used um, uh, methods to, to accomplish that, which were, which could be considered a form of computation. Um, it was really in the Second World War that uh, sort of large scale command and control computation uh, began to be pursued by governments, uh, starting in Britain um, um, with, uh, I believe, what was the name of the computer that was the electronic computer using back in tubes that was created? Um, it, it was, it wasn't Colossus, was it? I, I don't recall its, its name. Was it big, big something? Or... Maybe, or, or Goliath. It had a name like that, but, the, but, uh, but of course the purpose of this was to assist with the arming of, uh, of weapons, of guns, uh, artillery, um, because of course you have, you know, a great deal of mathematics involved in trying to determine where you should land your shell accurately to hit you know, your adversary and not your own position um, and so forth. How do you calculate that? Governments such as uh, Great Britain and the United States and others, certainly Germany as well, um, those that had the technical capacity devoted um, energy and effort into creating mechanical methods. And then once vacuum tubes became avail available, electronic methods, and then once digital became available, digital methods for accomplishing their goals, that's where the capital came in. In the 1950s, um, there was a fairly robust um, academic effort. Um, uh, the scientist named John McCarthy, who's a, a pioneer in the field of what is now called AI, um, um, was a participant, a key participant at a conference in Dartmouth college, I believe, in 1956, in which the term artificial intelligence was even coined. And for quite some time, it, that particular endeavor and other computational endeavors um, um, had a very prominent place within um, academic and actual, and actual scientific research and engineering effort. Banks, of course, were among the first to adopt large-scale computation. There's a 1950 or 1951 movie called The Desk Set with uh, Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy, which I believe is the first instance um, of a computer being presented in a, a popular film. Um, and in that movie, which is ironic considering how long ago it was, um, a, uh, not a bank, I think it was a department store, had an information desk that was led by Catherine Hepburn. And the idea was that, you know, Spencer Tracy is coming in and he's going to do what? He's going to replace these lovely ladies, these these really talented um, people, you know, who can find information with this computer that'll be able to, you know, to be able to uh, to, to locate information for people and therefore save the organization money. Um, the history is long and 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 uh, we don't have to go through all the details, um, but I think suffice to say that uh, um, computation on a large scale started as a military a military project. Right. And um, um, and then research into uh, trying to, to build cognition within machines using some of the ideas of individuals like Al Alan Turing, who many people I'm sure have heard of, and others. That was an academic effort. And then for a long time, it stayed there, whereas consumer computation went in directions I think we're all familiar with, with, you know, when Apple and other organizations entered um, uh, entered the fray, IBM being, I think, the first in that space. Um, but AI became a, a corporate, a large-scale corporate endeavor in the two, in the 2010s, principally, with the um, uh, when it was discovered 
that uh, graphics processing units or some call it game processing units um, can be used um, to accomplish some of the mathematics or to enact some of the mathematics which have been beyond the hardware capacity of earlier of earlier generations of computation. So I'll, I'll pause there because it, that's probably a little scattered because there, there's so much history. Oh, and, I know. And it would be hours, you know, to just just kind of like hours of, of, of snoozing to just kind of, for, for most people, to just kind of go through um, yeah. how we got to where we are today. And that's, that is really the tough thing about talking about this because uh, it's not interesting for most people. It's no, it's not. Pretty... Um, although there are interesting elements, like if you talk about, you know, the use of computation um, for artillery and, and then the impact that, that had upon actual people, that of course can be compelling. Or if you talk about the use of computation in the Manhattan Project and the obvious outcome of that, that can be interesting. And so the various applications of computation and the various permutations of computation apply, those stories are quite compelling or, or can be, you know, um, but just to, well, here, everyone, here's, here's how we got the iPhone or whatever, when, um, which is the kind of, you know, Discovery Channel, well, what the Discovery Channel used to do before, I, I don't know what they do today, but, um, but what they used to do, that kind of documentary, yeah, that, that's mostly, that's, that's kind of a snooze fest, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, let's just, let's get through just really quick, you know, what, what the actual hardware is that does this. So you basically have storage devices and you have mm -hmm. computation, you have circuits that, that you move the data around that's stored on the device mm -hmm. and put it through a logic gate or sets of logic gates. And those have an outcome of true or false or yes or no, yeah. or whatever you want. So, Symbolic logic is, is what yeah. that's used, yeah. So, build, so uh, the, the problem there is really a material one because these devices don't just come out of thin air, right? They require uh, minerals and other uh, resources that are yeah. scattered around the globe. That's right. And require intensive labor. Yes. And um, uh, and then there's the whole issue about their lack of reusability. That's exactly right. That um, at the basis of everything that we take for granted, whether it's what we're doing right now, um, or, or Twitter or Facebook, God forbid, um, or the insane, the almost mad scientist, but not in a not in an interesting way. Uh, objectives of Zuckerberg with um, the impossible meta project, which is uh, it's quite hilarious to watch that crash and burn as many people who have any sense predicted. But anyway, um, and actually this is a actually this is a good meta um, provides a metaverse provides a good example. So as you said, uh, computation is based upon the extraction, the processing, the shipping, the selling of um, of, of goods. And uh, the raw material um, um, that goes into the creation of the, of the chips and, and the plastic housing and the metal and so forth, um, that of course exacts a toll on, on the earth and it also exacts a toll on the people, most of whom are mistreated, who actually are a part of that supply chain at the base level. And then the processing, which, which of course involves the use of quite caustic materials that are then dumped into the environment um, and then, of course, the, the, the long supply chains, um, shipping containers full of finished goods, uh, most of which come from China um, um, today, um, which is why the Biden administration's mm -hmm. recent moves are quite interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see the um, unlooked for consequences of what they're trying to accomplish with their semiconductor uh, embargo. But anyway, um, um, everything is based upon physical stuff. Right. And, and, this is what the tech press doesn't talk about. It's what people at the commanding heights of the industry don't talk about. It's what developers don't talk about. Um, there is a, a very prominent techie um, on Twitter who I follow, lives in Hawaii, I won't name him, lives in Hawaii and you know everybody loves this guy. He's kind of a groovy dude. And he, he describes software development as magic. And this is a common motif, right? That it's just magic that you know these magical elves are making these magical things. And no one yeah. wants to talk about how dirty 
this industrial process is. And, and, right. and also, when I challenge people in the industry, particularly some of the luminaries who are always going off on flights of fancy about, you know, building intelligence and so forth, when I ask them, how many GPUs and TPUs, um, TensorFlow processing units, were used, you know, to, um, to build this thing? Um, uh, how, many, how many of them had to be replaced via failure? What happened to them? Did you throw them in, did you throw them in the dumpster? What happens mm -hmm. to them once they get in the dumpster? All these just hard, hard material questions. There's just silence because that, that spoils the party. The idea that what you're talking about is not a magic box, but it's more akin to like a Ford Mustang than it is like some glowing cube. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I live in Arizona and uh, Arizona has two things that make it um, well, it has one thing that makes it really good for tech, which is that it's dry, mm. a dry heat. Yes. Uh, but on the other hand, that means you need to pump a ton of water in. And Arizona does not have uh, amazing water resources. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge uh, like max level that you're going to be able to get to in, with data centers in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, which sort of brings us into your you were mostly talking about the hardware that goes into the computers but then there's the the internet itself yes which requires transnational mm -hmm. uh fiber optic cables mm -hmm. and these and what many people may not know i mean you know we, we take this for granted because you know this is our our bread and butter but what many people may not know is that these as you said they're they're transoceanic I and mean, people have laid massive cables you know that have to settle on on the sh on shelves in in the ocean it's a massive undertaking and then there's equipment like networking equipment that has to at which these these cables have to terminate to then distribute um you know data flows to your locality so when i'm i'm, I'm in europe and you're in arizona well we are talking through one of these cables um right now actually right exactly and there's and so I think that's, to me, this is an obviously huge political uh, problem. Yes. Uh, especially for, you know, not just because it's capital, but even, you know, from an anarchist perspective, mm -hmm. as far as the, the state infrastructure that's required to not only develop it, but to negotiate and maintain. It's massive. All, yeah. And, 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 I, I, and I will say... Um, although there are precedents because, of course, the transatlantic and the transoceanic um, telegraph cables of the 19th century, and early 20th century, of course, are precedent for this. So, so it's not entirely new, um, but it does require a level of, of state control and coordination and a level of coordination between nations that um, is obviously fragile. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean... When Russia invaded Ukraine and there were moves against Moscow, you know, sanctions and what have you, and um, Putin then threatened, you know, Facebook and other organizations, uh, I believe one of the things he stated, if I'm not um, mis misquoting or I'm not quoting, but misstating, is, you know, the seizure of data centers. Like, you know, any data center you may have on our soil could be seized. Now, I do not believe that happened. Perhaps it did. But... Um, uh, this is the kind of geopolitical stress that could completely fragment and destroy what we take for granted. And also, how long do we think that these relationships can endure? Um, to, uh, this week, um, I believe the Biden administration announced some fairly uh, draconian moves against the, uh, the PRC regarding semiconductors. Um, uh, their assumption seems to be that uh, nothing will happen <laughs> as a result, but every action does indeed inspire a reaction, yeah? And, um, um, and so we, we don't know, but that's an example of the way that these, these international relationships you know, are, are kind of on a knife's edge. Um, and, and so the, the technical infrastructure, the extraction, the processing, the manufacture, the shipping, the distribution, the sale, all of these things are very complicated um, processes uh, that require, as you said, like a level of state command and control um, because corporations really can't do these things alone. They, they pretend that they do, but they, yeah. but they can't. 
And I want to touch on that. Well, I guess we could touch on that now. So one of the stories that's been told uh, that I've heard a lot lately because of like tracing back the radical right to 4chan and things like that is the the story of the California ideology and mm -hmm. libertarian capitalist values and mm -hmm. the way that um uh the way that created a utopia a techno utopia that people or at least thought, the idea of a techno yeah, yeah, yeah 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 the idea of one mm -hmm. uh and um uh, that isn't really even all the story because you know uh so the internet you know as you said it started off as a military development from arpa and mm -hmm. then was given to the national science foundation who then sold it into the private sector mm -hmm. which which means that uh there's all this funding that came from the public uh, went into the development of this and then mm -hmm. it was turned over to the private sector to make massive profits off of it mm -hmm. so that story we have but uh that's not so some of that is continued and i know that um you so you're advancing that story in a lot of different ways yeah um how do you see the propaganda coming out of silicon valley uh around ai today and how does that relate to the realities of uh geopolitics and mm -hmm. uh just infrastructure development and the actually existing material conditions i um my thesis to sound a bit grand about it um is that the story that companies such as google and fellow travelers are building intelligence um or building things such as you know self-driving cars or trucks that this is an, an anti-labor it's an anti-labor effort um, because they cannot do it. Like for example, Amazon cannot replace warehouse workers with robots. They can insert robotics into some parts of the flow just as happened has, ha, as has happened in various manufacturing um, uh, sectors, but they cannot entirely replace people with robotics because there's as many things that people do that robots um, um, cannot replicate. Uh, however, mm -hmm. I believe that the people who own these organizations or who do the research, uh, unless they are completely blinkered and, and an individual like Musk, maybe, although I, 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 th I think he knows what he's doing, um, but, um, they know that they're not telling the truth because they, they, they have the data, they see the results of their tests. They see that, for example, a self-driving truck is impossible. Right. So then you tell the story that what well, we're building a self-driving truck well there's a couple of reasons to do this one is because we've been fed a diet of science fiction for quite some time and which tells us that certain things are possible and the myth of progress um, um which seems to be a reality because we have seen technical change so we believe that therefore um because you know you see a rocket go into space that therefore anything is possible but no that just means that it was possible to build a rocket that goes into space it doesn't right. mean that other things are necessarily possible. There has to be parsimony in our thinking. So they understand the limitations, but they nevertheless, they say that they can do this. And my thesis is that they do so to destabilize the confidence of labor. Because if you're a trucker and you believe that you can be replaced by a robot truck, you may be less inclined to demand the wages and the benefits that you deserve. Right. Um, and trucking is, you know, an extremely difficult, dangerous um, field, but it's critical to logistics. It's far yes. more critical than hedge funds traders, right? Um, uh, but um, but the hedge funds traders like to fund companies that claim that they're building um, autonomous trucks because those individuals may believe, those traders, those VCs, they may believe that it's possible because what do they know, really? Yep. But, but the technologists, the technology companies know better. Um, now, many of, the, many of the people who are very enthusiastic, who they hire, don't know because they they're, they're, they're kind of have blinders on. But I believe that owners do know this. And so if you can accomplish the goal 
of getting labor to stand down from its demands, then whether you make autonomous trucks or not, and not is the answer, um, then you've accomplished your mission, which is which is uh, disciplining labor, right? And so th th that is my, and, and in fact, I, I view Dali that, um, which produces mm -hmm. synthesized images based upon the work of untold numbers of artists, right? I see that as a direct attack on the um, the practice of art, of, of a corporation, you know, say, or somebody, you and me, hiring somebody said, well, I need a portrait, you know, of something, right? Now there's this massively powered um, system that, um, or even with stable diffusion, there's you know, something that you can just run, run on your computer um, that allows you to do this without having to involve an artist. The artist was involved in the past, but mm -hmm. through theft, now you've, you've created a pattern matching system um, that can produce you know, this so-called art. That is an attack um, on, on, on workers and the workers in this case being artists. And that's why I interpret the entire field of what we call AI as an assault on labor. Um, it, it could be an aid. Um, we could create systems that were decision aids. The example that I give is um, the, the Star Trek, the theorized Star Trek computer uh, in which um, say Jordi LaForge is having, it's not really a conversation. He doesn't understand it as a conversation, but there's an interaction with the system that's able to give him information that then assists him in, in, in solving a problem. That is a vision of computation that's actually quite laudable, right? Um, but that's not what we have. What we have are systems that can't even do that, right? but they're presented as if they can replace everything that we do. And, and because it's a lie and a lie that's understood, that's why I call it propaganda. And then it's, you know, they could get all the way to like 99% with like self-driving cars or something, but that 1%, uh, it's got infinite edge cases. That's precisely right. And, and this is what, um, when I tell people, well, someone said to me once, I was going for a hike and um, uh, my friend I was hiking with said, well, what if we just put quantum computers in cars? And this is an example, right, of the magical thinking because mm -hmm. he, he doesn't know what quantum computers are. He doesn't know number one, the amount of hardware required to, to create a quantum state within a machine. And also that quantum computers are really only used for very specific types of, of mathematical applications. They're not just, oh, I, I need Microsoft Word. But if I have Microsoft right. Word quantum, it would be really fantastic. And so I said, yeah, well, we're not going to, be, no one's going to be building any quantum computers in a car form factor. And while we were talking, I just showed him a picture on my phone of an IBM research quantum computer. I said, so th this is what one of these beasts looks like. Mm -hmm. Here's the power and IBM very nicely, you know, did power requirements, cooling requirements. It was actually a very detailed white paper. I said, so do you really think you're going to get that in a car form factor? He said, right. well, you know, with, with, with advancements and that's the mindset that we're up against, like you know, with advancements, right? And I said, dude, the level of advancement that would be required to, to, um, to put this rig, this kit in a car form factor, um, it exceeds, exceeds the imagination. Oh, well, it doesn't see the, we can imagine it, but it exceeds our, our capabilities um, by orders of magnitude that, that you probably can't even calculate. So um, for now and, and far, far into the future. And one final point, and then I'll be quiet. Another, another point is that there's an assumption of unbroken development into the future. Right. But, but, but we face climate change we face various sorts of stressors on the global system. And yet we think that we'll just a thousand years from now, people will still be doing exactly what we're doing only better. But, but there's, there's lots of evidence that this, this is not the situation at all. Um, that maybe 50 years from now, um, we, we may not be able to do this. We really don't know. Right. And so, um, um, and so what those of us who talk about the materiality of computation are up against, is the fantasy uh, inculcated by science fiction or inspired, I should say, by science fiction, but then further developed by the industry itself, by the tech press and so forth, which, which obscures on, on purpose, um, I, I, I believe. Yeah, and then uh, there's also a lot of just recycling of old ideas that are presented mm. in a new way. So mm -hmm. especially with software, you get it, it, over the past 20 years, it's like, 
the cloud model or the virtualization model gets mm -hmm. moved so like oh now everything should be on on the on your own computer and then you don't you know they just keep going back and forth between like yes. three different architectural models and yeah yeah it, it's really and and when i talk to people who are much younger than me who are in this business and then they say oh you must be so dazzled by all the things that are happening I'm like, no. no i'm not because what you're impressed by I mean, I've seen some iteration of that 20 years ago. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. actually really frustrating because yes. you wind up just uh, um, going back to something you already did and yeah. saw the limitations of and moved away from like, already. But, I, I would, but Jared, I would say that the reason that this is happening is not because new things are impossible. It's because computation is a handmaiden of capitalism. In and other that's words, where I wanted to go with this. Yeah, if yeah. we were liberated, if the computation, if the practice of computation could be liberated by the imperatives of mm -hmm. capitalism, we don't really know what, what might be possible. I, I was recently reading um, um, a history of cybernetics and, um, and some of the, the experiments that were conducted by the early cyberneticians in the 1940s up to the 1970s are quite astounding. Like ideas like, when well, perhaps we can use a pond and the movement of uh, molecules within a pond or the movement of life within a pond to perform, comp to perform computation, right? Now, these kinds of things seem absurd to us, but we don't know if that's possible or not because no one is going to do experiments with it. Right. Because digital, digital rules the day and digital rules the day because digital um, assists our current order with its command and control our requirements. Yeah, and I wanted to talk about some, you know, what alternatives can look like. One that I see promoted a lot on like Jacobin or things like that is uh, the nationalization of platforms or the nationalization mm. of um, the internet, which basically just looks like making it a utility that's, yeah. you know, costs uh, and profits are eliminated. So, uh, but there is another direction uh, that has been, you know, there's a long history of struggle with this, which is decentralized forms of mm -hmm. technology. And you see this, whether it's like off-gridding, like getting energy from solar or wind or whatever, mm -hmm. and not living on the electrical grid. But you also see versions of this with the internet itself, whether we're talking mm -hmm. about, um, you know, farmers creating their own co-ops, co-op ISPs, mm -hmm. or uh, there was, I read something once about these farmers in a town that created their own telephone network using the mm -hmm. wires on the fences that connected their houses. Sure, why not? Yeah. Or just um, there's all sorts of things that can be done, and even the things that seem harder, like DNS. Mm -hmm. uh, there is OpenNIC, which was an experiment in open DNS. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I wanted to just talk about where some of this potential is and things that people have done or are currently doing or can do. I think that um, one of the steps towards that goal would be rejecting obsolescence. So, for example, um, uh, those of us who are of a certain age remember when Intel released the Pentium chip. Mm -hmm. um, on you know, desktop computers, um, and then also released a whole slew of servers, you know, with Pentium and multi-core processors and so forth. And, you know, those, those ran quite fine. Um, but then the demands of the software, and here we can insert one of the insights of uh, computer scientist, uh, Yaron Lanier, who in his um, essay, One Half of a Manifesto from 10 years or so ago, uh, stressed the fact that Hardware has made you know interesting strides, but software is horrible. And as software continues to make more demands, you know, hardware of course has um, changed to, uh, to to. Well, yeah. Let me demands. let me throw something in there too. When you say the software, a lot of the like the ways that computation is increased to run a certain kind of software is stuff like animated screen transitions yes. or just this graphical just stupid like, things stupid yeah things, yes and things that um um are used as marketing hooks in other words and this is why the removal of the capitalist imperative would be helpful so just as a, a quick aside 
uh, recently I rewatched um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oh, nice. And one of the things about that movie that I, I love dearly uh, as a person in this field is just the, the clarity of those interfaces. I mean, they were animated, of course, um, in 1968. But the clarity, like, for example, when the ships, when uh, the Discovery's uh, systems are just as like, nav just pops on the screen. Oh, now I'm going to show you some navigational data. Calm. <laughs> now I'm going to show you some communications data. It's so clean. that they're, they're, um, Their vision for a clean interface that had no frills, just gave you what you wanted. Star Trek has done this as well with the LCARs, with the imagined LCAR system, with library computer access and retrieval system. Um, so there are people who have imagined interfaces that, you know, totally non-commercial interfaces that probably would not require that much hardware to run. Um, but so, but to get back to the main point, so imagine if we were to to um, abolish obsolescence, right? Right. Then there would be piles of computers that could be that were manufactured. And that's a sunk cost. Like you've already extracted the minerals, you've already gone through the process, but they, they function perfectly. You can reuse them over and over again. And then when they no longer function, one of the things you'd have to do, like genuinely no longer function, and find you know methods of, of recycling the materials. Um, and uh, non obsolescence, I think, would be a way of uh, materially contributing to a, a democratic computational um, infrastructure. Yeah, and so uh, let's just dip real quick into like, what are some of the hurdles to reusing stuff like old processors? Because like the instruction set of a processor is one yes. hurdle. Yes. Or because the whole programming language is gonna have limits on yes. what type of instruction sets it's yes. written to. But yeah, yeah. That, that's certainly the use of commercial software, um, which of course um, um, it depends upon the steppings, uh, as they say, of a CPU, of the, the actual infrastructure of a CPU. Right. Um, um, that is a limitation. So of course, what is the answer to that? Well, the answer is, is, to, is, is to return return to the past in order to move to the future. And the mm -hmm. past would be programming directly as when I first entered this industry, there were people who were writing assembly code um, that is to say, they were writing code directly to the hardware. Exactly. And then creating beautiful effects based upon that. Um, that's still possible, but, but that, that is a, an art that is balkanized within Intel and other places and it is not as common as it used to be. Um, um, so in order to liberate the hardware from obsolescence, you have to then be able to speak to the hardware, so to speak, or write to the hardware directly to then make, make use of it to then create create that that 2001 style interface in which it's just it's just giving you the data that you need mm -hmm. and you're not worried about all the pretty effects. If you can make pretty effects, I mean, you know, we're humans, we like pretty things. That's fine. Sure. And people are quite creative. There are many things that are possible within the limits of this hardware. Um, you know, that, that, that are not being not that we're not done and not being done because it's it's all it's commercial. So a couple of things there. One is so there are some really fringe groups that do work on creating this hardware as we speak i mean whether mm -hmm. it's you know taking like microcontrollers and you what is it risk or arm is the one that uh, is very amenable to uh, i believe uh, i believe risk actually is 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 pretty um, is, is extensible in that way so that's something people are trying to do and mm -hmm. then on the other hand it's the open source hardware movement yes and then on the other hand when you talk about beautifying it uh, or making it making things look good, uh, even at the hardware level, obsolescence actually gets in the way of that because, mm -hmm. you know, you could, ha you know, people make their own musical instruments or they make mm -hmm. all these things look great. But the way that we have obsolescence today prevents sort of the art the application of aesthetics to like, you know, building your own computer cases that are mm -hmm. custom and making them look great or things like that. And yes. Yeah, yeah which I, I certainly grew up doing, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I would buy parts and I would build my build my computer. This is a lost, an almost entirely lost art as well. I mean, we are dependent upon, um, and the reason why I, I talk about um, repurposing existing machinery until, you know, different methods for creating new machinery, because I would not want to to halt uh, the creativity of people who said, "Well, I have an idea." 
for another mm -hmm. way of doing this. And, you know, um, you can imagine a democratic, a truly democratic society um, in which people would say, yeah, I have an idea. I think this will help us in the following way. I need some resources to do that. And which resources could be devoted, you know, to advance, to genuinely advancing the state of the art, not, not this phony advancement that we're getting to this or something uh, R.C. Roberts um, introduced me to, I believe was an idea of Aldous Huxley, false transcendence, which, which, um, um, which is a, a, a gorgeous, gorgeous idea. Um, and it describes the tech industry to a T, you know, that um, I'm presenting you a transcendent idea that's in your head, but it's not actually transcendent. There's nothing transcendent about it. It's a, it's a false transcendence, but, um, uh, um, but yeah, we, we are, in the, in the initial stages of a new world, so to speak, we would be dependent upon this old hardware. Um, but it would last long enough that we would probably be able to, to use it for quite some time. Um, I, I remember I was on a project years ago and there was, um, I was sent to uh, uh, Texas. Um, I, was, I was consulting at a, a chemical for a chemical company based out of uh, Philadelphia, uh, Roman Haas, as a matter of fact, which I think was eventually purchased by Morton Salt. Um, and there was a, a division of the company, a plant that by the, uh, according to central IT was misbehaving. And by misbehaving, they weren't following whatever, you know, the corporate standards. So I went to this location and then I found out that what they had done in order to solve a problem, which was the problem of the plant operators needing to be able to parse their data was they built a Beowulf cluster. Um, they took a, a group of, at that time, uh, 486 computers that were just molding away in a, in a closet, um, a storage uh, area of this plant, and they just stacked them up and they built a Beowulf cluster. And they, yeah. and they, they, and they wrote hardware to allow plant, um, um, the individuals in the plant who did analysis of the state of the plant to do that in, in a way that um, was cost effective. What was curious was that the corporation, of course, did not like this because they had relationships with Dell and so forth. Uh -huh. um, but this is the kind of thing that, you know, that you and I or in a democratic society, we would say, you know, um, bravo, brava. What, what, what a fantastic thing you've done. You've repurposed this old stuff. You've made it useful. You're giving us an analytical platform, which is fantastic. Um, but for that, for that corporation, that, 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 was, that, that, that was a no-no because it didn't fit within you have to order hardware, new hardware, and install this software that's approved and so forth and so on. Yeah. Uh, so for people who might want to like get on this road themselves, you know, so you mentioned assembly language and uh, is there anything else? I know when we say that a lot of what we're talking about is writing drivers, right? Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, for many people, yeah, I, um, you know, actually, I think I should write about this on my blog because, um, uh, there are many parts of the past and of writing code against hardware directly, as opposed to the abstraction layers that um, that, that we're dealing with today. Um, that uh, I think it's I think there are many people would probably find quite interesting, um, and it's it's a way of actually being quite creative and understanding the hardware um, right. at, at, a, at, a, at a rather deep level. Yeah, and it's something that no one's really encouraged to learn. No. Uh, uh, you know, when you learn coding at whatever school or university, you're learning like web app development. You're not yes. really, or maybe usually not operating system level stuff, but definitely not hardware level stuff. Well, and, and when you're, like, when you're on Twitter, for example, and you, you, you know, I, I follow a lot of techies on Twitter, many of whom are in California. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're always talking, they're always teching the tech, talking about that. But what they're really talking about is building internet scale web, web applications on AWS. Right. Exactly. Which we yeah. didn't even, we didn't even get on the topic of virtualization yeah. and how many different forms of that there is in the stack. Yeah. And, yeah. But... yeah and, and, and so, but, but no one, and I, and maybe I need to, to curate my, my, uh, my, my Twitter following a bit more carefully, but no one who I follow is talking about, well, there is one organization, Oxide Computer, um, you know, who are building, who are trying to kind of revive, um, uh, in, in, you know, 
as a corporation, but even so, I, I think they're good people. They're trying to revive a lot of what we're talking about in terms of understanding the hardware, building against the hardware, writing against the hardware, and so forth. Um, but it is an almost entirely lost art. Young people are not learning it. And they are so far removed from the abstraction, from a direct understanding of what computation is. And this is my concern about so-called clown, is that there are people, um, my younger colleagues, who not having had my experience in data centers directly, don't even really understand what I'm talking right. about when I describe data centers, at the data centers that are at the, at the heart of so-called cloud, because they, they, they haven't walked those spaces, they haven't been in those rooms, they haven't you know, cut their hands on the rails and, and done all that stuff. And yeah. so um, you know, to them, it's just entirely an abstraction. And so when someone says to them, oh, it's infinite, it's infinite scale, which is what all these companies say, right? Um, and I say, well, no, nothing is infinite. There's, there's a machine in a giant room and they have to keep putting machines in this room. And they, the clever thing that the hyperscalers have done is they created methods of resiliency so that they can swap out entire boards and you know, there's no interruption. Oh, well, there's interruption, but, but you know, they minimize the interruptions um, you know, because they, of, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they just, they have, they have two or three different data centers running the same yeah. stuff and they move yeah. the traffic off of one and onto another onto while another. they're doing exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, and then you just use a you know a um, a, a content uh, delivery network to just uh, abstract or, or you know abstract the access and I mean these are all things that uh, have been around for quite some time that they've simply scaled them up and yes. and and then pretended that um, that they've invented something new and they haven't they've invented uh, n really nothing new at all I mean yeah yeah I mean people will say well there's there's water cooling now um, rather than using you know the the chillers that uh, those oh yeah yeah. Which are and popular. and that gets back to what you're saying is that okay so you're using water cooling that's great water cooling was used in, in high performance game systems 20 years ago but uh, but there are places like Arizona and increasingly all places where the use of this water cooling is becoming a problem yeah um, like in Utah for example it's my understanding that it's having a big impact there was a lot of controversy here in the Netherlands where I am over the construction of I believe it was a Microsoft data center because of the amount of water potable water that it was going to consume. Um, these data centers are starting to come up against the needs of people yeah. as they continue to have to build them to meet, meet the need. Yeah, so there's all sorts of things that, um, there's all sorts of hurdles and all sorts of little projects that are working on overcoming those hurdles. And uh, we're in a really interesting time uh, because so much is gonna be falling apart when it comes yeah. to these massive centralized uh, corporations running the infrastructure that everything depends on. And there's a, a very interesting future ahead. Yes, I think so. And um, yeah, it's gonna be a bumpy ride, I think. Um, however, I think also there's an opportunity because um, you know from whatever disruption occurs that there is a possibility for for for, for creativity to flow uh, once again and 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 not outside of computation but also in computation i, I think that um um i don't want to get all chemical for Leibowitz uh, about it uh, for those who've read that novel about a post-apocalyptic society that rebuilds its uh, over time rebuilds its its capacity um because it forgot what what led it's a it's a fantastic book actually um, uh, in which uh, there is a, it's from the 1960s, um, Canticle for Leibowitz, it's called. And there's a nuclear holocaust, of course. This is the 60s. Um, so that was the primary concern. Although apparently it's a concern once again. But, yeah. um, but anyway, um, in the wreckage of that society that was destroyed by the nuclear holocaust, a group of monks retain some knowledge of the previous society. And then once things settle down a bit, it is these monks who they uh, they rebuild, they help the society rebuild. And, and computers in that world are called the machina analytica. And so they they um, they retain knowledge of computation through this idea in, in illuminated books of the machina analytica. And so I, I don't know if you know anything like that will happen or if we'll be completely devastated in that way. I, I imagine more of a 
un unraveling of things. Um, yeah. But in any event, I, I think that there will be an opportunity from that for people to actually imagine and actually do new things. So I'm not, I'm, I'm pessimistic in the, in the near term, but I'm, I'm a bit more hopeful in the longer term only because uh, I think that uh, we are very adaptable animals. Well, Dwayne, uh, it has been awesome bursting some bubbles. There are so many more bubbles to burst. And also talking about uh, new hopes uh, in the future. Yeah. And um, thank you very much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you. And uh, is there anything you want to promote before we uh, hit the stop? No, I, I, I just uh, I encourage people to, to you know, follow me on Twitter, if you so desire, at, at Cloud Keystador, and also follow my blog. And um, um, because not only do I talk about what I do, I also highlight the work of other people who I think are doing like fantastic work. So I, I'm trying to be a resource um, pointing to, to like a, I guess, the constellation of people who are trying to, as you say, burst bubbles, but also um, imagine all alternative futures. So, yeah. Awesome. And I'll make sure to include those links in the show description. Fantastic.